the saga. Um, uh, but so I've been in crypto a while. I've been in films a while. And I've tried to figure out how you get them to work together, right? And I think there's a number of problems with this. I think games and crypto make a lot of sense. Uh, and by the way, for the record, I've also made a crypto Web3 game. Uh, that's a whole nother saga. And we've done a lot of GameFi spaces. But I think with films, it's a little different because it's less clear kind of what to sell, for example. I mean, what's funny is in, in Pixar, you know, it's funny. Uh, the Well, I think everyone at Pixar was there because they, they wanted to make art, right? But you know, the, the story team, which was like a team of 30 people, the story team at Pixar, the team of 30 people at the time, this was 2010, by the way, uh, out of a team of a thousand people to make a film uh, for a regular Pixar film at that time, you know, we would say jokingly, but also not jokingly, after we got acquired by Disney, you know, Disney acquired Pixar for $7 billion uh, in the late 2000s. Uh, but we would say, hey, films, uh, you know, these these films we're making like cars are like 90 minute commercials right <laughs> that'd be like the that could be kind of sarcastic way to do it so there, there are ways to monetize because a lot of times films make more money off the economics of films i mean especially in this era where box office is where it is it's more about the merchandising and things like that right that's where a lot of the you know even for large films especially for large films where a lot of the um economics come from but uh, the economics of films have been breaking down for years and years right so let's set the stage here right so you know, for a while, you had, you know, actual things called theaters that we, that you would go to, you would physically get in maybe your car, maybe if you're lucky, you could walk to one, and you'd go in, and you buy some popcorn for a large price, some Coca-Cola, and you sit for 90 minutes, and you watch a thing, and it was great, right? Uh, those days uh, are fast receding. Um, I just went to Dune 2 and IMAX. My first film I've seen that is not in Sundance or Venice, like one of these film festivals, I go to film, a lot of film festivals, by the way, uh, just because, you know, I had films in them. Uh, but I was at Venice just a few years, ago, uh, just a few months ago, last last summer, last fall, and I was at uh, Sundance, right? So outside of those festivals, it's been five years since I've gone to a regular film a theater, even though I'm a filmmaker. And what's amazing is just how few people there are. I mean, you have these beautiful, gleaming theaters and no one's there. So the economics are changing. And you got to believe in some way, crypto can have opportunities, but somehow crypto has more direct, you know, gaming associations than it does with film. So, um, you know, that's kind of setting the stage. Um, and I'd like to go to people, and by the way, everyone, I know we have a bunch of people from Filmio, I can't wait to go into the AMA, but you guys probably know more about this than anyone else, so any of you guys uh, who want to jump in, you know, Brian, Ian, you know, and others, um, please uh, feel for Chris, please feel free to dive in on this, because you guys are probably more experts here than, than some of the rest of us, um, and then we'll go to your AMA, of course, at the last 15, but don't be shy, uh, raise your hand or just jump in, but I guess the question I ask for folks is, what are the, the, the before we get into specific companies or specific projects, what are the ways in which we think stories, right? We're talking about stories that play out on video screen. What are the ways in which they can integrate with crypto? And what are, what are the, some of the challenges, right, for, for doing that, right? So one challenge I might say is distribution. Just straight up distribution, right? Netflix, YouTube, when it comes, or TikTok especially, have, you know, stranglehold on distribution when it comes to, you know, online content. But the fact that TikTok did emerge in the last few years and became really popular means distribution can still be disrupted. But maybe I'll start with distribution first and see if anybody here uh, wants to bite on that question. I can jump in. Uh, hey, Eugene and, and Moon and Emily. Uh, Saf with Filmio here. But I think the you actually your question actually just touches the point. You mentioned games and crypto has some traction. We've seen stories and comics and crypto has some traction. At the end of the day, storytelling and crypto and ownership of both creators as well as their fan in the creation is a, a value proposition of crypto which is uh, which is the exciting thing and, and a project like filmio is unique you know you guys actually started to talk about the market research and, and all the l1 activity filmio operates on, on polygon l2 um by definition this is necessary when we're talking about the project that oh sorry uh, no a project that is out to um, essentially onboard, you know, billion pop culture fans and, and not just a niche, um, you know, no point in them or, or, you know, to diminish anything, but it's not just a niche investment opportunity we're talking about. It's it's a real movement that L2s are driving and Filmio and Film3 um, and actually Web3 Games, to your point, is, you know, a little bit further ahead. But this is what projects that you see deployed on Polygon and, and other L2s, this is why they're there. Uh, and the technology, the L2 technology allows 
uh, for lower gas fees and the onboarding as well as kind of the volume of transactions that happen on a platform like Filmio. Um, Brian here can uh, can tell you a little bit more about the platform, maybe if you want to ju jump in. Um, but yeah, to your point, I think it's all about kind of storytelling in crypto as opposed to any niche of storytelling. And we've seen Warner Brothers and DC Comics and, and other major players uh, jumping in early in the space and actually have their own, um, you know, success stories with DC, uh, you know, uh, blockchain comic franchise as an example. Yeah, yeah that, those are those are great yeah, points. Um, mm -hmm. ju just to chime in real quick, I think that Web three, the opportunity where you know Web three and film intersects, um, you know, film three, quote unquote, is um, largely about uh, the democratization of the space, right? Where you know fans are typically sitting on the sidelines waiting for a film to come out. They pay at the box office, or you know, like you said, that's kind of fading away, but um, you know, they pay in some fashion to consume. Right, I, think that's sad. I think there's nothing better <laughs> for a filmmaker than the experience of like having your film yeah. up on a screen with, a, with an audience. I remember when I was in film school, like that was incredible. It wasn't like a huge packed audience. It was just like your student friends, but man, my heart was beating out of my chest the first time I, oh, I, I screened 100%. a film. You know what I mean? 100%. Like in a, in a theater. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we want to like, we want to spawn some sub DAOs just to go buy theaters and keep them open, you know? <laughs> um, Dude, please do, man. Please do. That's <laughs> That's another conversation, but yeah, I mean, it is kind of sad, but the thing is that, you know, um, fans have never really had uh, an equal seat at the table, right? Like that's where a lot of the losses from the studios come from as well as everybody sort of guesses at what people want. And at the end of the day, web three represents this amazing opportunity to really bring community into the aspect of filmmaking. Um, get the authentic involvement because without Web3, as you guys all know very well, you always have a centralized power or authority that is, you know, standing up, um, let's say, a social network, Facebook or what have you, which is the gathering place for um, community and in our case, fans, right? So, you know, you never really have the opportunity for that authentic uh, relationship to evolve in a place where, um, you know, it's not able to be corrupted easily. So, you know, largely we're talking about governance really at a high level. And I think that's kind of one of the things that um, Web3 brings as an opportunity to the film space is to sort of neutralize the centralized powers, um, allow for that democratization, which is a little bit of a cliche these days, obviously, but it is actually really true in, in this case. Um, and then to kind of level the playing field where, you know, fans and creators are able to um, interact with each other and, you know, really creates a much more data-driven environment as well. So we think that it's going to overall, you know, really improve the quality of um, the stories that are being told and the content that we are consuming um, and uh, overall just really improve the whole ecosystem. But uh, Eugene, I want to go back to what you originally asked, which was about distribution. And here's the thing, distribution is in flux. Distribution is changing. If you talk to the people that I know in Hollywood, some of which are some of the highest level players in, in the game, it, right now Hollywood's mentality about what comes next is we don't know. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, and if you listen to what Brian said and, and to what Asaf said, then naturally, Distribution has to change because that's been the chokehold where control over what gets seen by the masses has always been inflicted and the masses are no longer okay with that and there are now so many different ways for you to consume content plus, you know, I mean, look at TikTok. It, it proved that you could monetize a three-minute selfie. So self-distribution alternate distribution channels, less distribution control, I imagine, is part of what we're going to see in the future. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely true. And in fact, TikTok, uh, I mean, it's really interesting to see the differences, too, between like TikTok and, you know, Katzenberg and Meg Whitman's Quibi, right, which was kind of like a sort of centralized top-down. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, 
And, you know, I don't want to, I mean, I, I have met uh, Jeffrey. He did visit our studio and several people worked at DreamWorks. So uh, I'll just say the news has, has covered that plenty enough. Uh, <laughs> I met Meg Whitman at some Goldman conference right before, right as she was launching Quibi, actually, uh, when they did their tech conference, the annual one in Bla the Bellagio in Vegas. Um, and I think they're a smart team, but, you know, I think history has proven that, you know, so, like in the day of, you know, mass consumers making content, hey, democ bottom up democratization. I think TikTok feels alive in a way that maybe a lot of other media types kind of don't today, right? You know what I mean? And they did prove you can disrupt traditional distribution, right? ByteDance is a random company based out of China with its CEO in yeah. Singapore has like yeah, the biggest thing. Cool, but what yeah. Kobe did was they tried to include a whole new piece of, of, of form of content and that was the, the biggest gating issue to anybody being able to participate. That's right. That's right, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that for the bottom up, I mean, there's so much creativity out there in the world and there's so many creative minds. So I look forward to going back to this. I think distribution is key. And I look forward to Ian picking your brain about some of the confusion that the big Hollywood players have, which uh, I don't blame them because it's confusing. Right. And where crypto can come in. Right. Can crypto be the savior? Um, well, not only so, yeah. crypto, but Web3. I mean, the, the ideas of Web3, like in other industries where it's disintermediated, it has found let's call it uh, uh, connection players that are no longer needed. And the film industry is a huge industry of connection players that move things from one piece to another that can be done less costly and more efficiently with technology than with human participation. And we're already seeing some of that. I mean, WME is trying to go private. Why? Yeah, and that's an interesting point. You know, those connection players, they're not needed in their current role, right? But the interesting thing is, is that um, where we kind of see some bad actors out there in certain cases where the centralized power um, among, let's just say, a studio here or there um, could end up influencing, you know, undue control over a process. Like, who's cast in a film? How much money is available? Whether it gets uh, greenlit at all? Things like that. Um, you know, those players in a Web3 context will more or less be forced to play by the rules, you know, and that's sort of an infrastructure also that we have been working on. That's something that we've actually created where they don't actually get completely disintermediated. They just get brought in through the context of, you know, here's your role. Here's how you play. You can still make movies. You just can't um, abuse the process. Right. And that's really very important for, I think, society as a whole going forward. Some will evolve, yeah. some will change completely, and some will go away, just like we've seen in every other market sector that's been affected by this. Yeah, definitely. And I want to go to Maybe the where it's really interesting, uh, just it reminds me to tie uh, back to kind of the initial talk here, because when you talk about Web3 projects, when you talk about Film3, you're looking at established industry. It's not, it's not a project that is tapping in to take a piece of the DeFi or the crypto, you know, L1, um, you know, Pi or Map. These are actually projects that have proven markets. The film industry is, is making decisions that, that drive, you know, billions of dollars. Some estimates say 100 billions a year. This is what projects like Filmio, like Warner Brothers projects in the space, this is what they're tapping into. This is, um, this is unique. And at the end of the day, anybody that joins Filmio and, and become a DAO member, uh, fans and creators, they get a seat at the table with the traditional industry. You know, you get to be uh, essentially a movie producer from the early on. And at the end of the day, beyond just being able to green light projects in the long term, as producer, you're going to benefit from whatever your collaboration has, you know, has, uh, has resulted in, you know, if the film becomes successful, not just the creator and their fans and, you know, their investors, and there's a whole chain of, of you know, stakeholders that are currently ignored, and yeah. that's fundamentally what Web3 changes. Yeah, I, wanna, I, like um, we, I, I want to, uh, yeah, yeah, Brian, I'll give you the mic, and then we we'll want to go to Emily and, and Pattern, but, and then also want to do a shout out to the comments, but Brian, yeah, I'll give you the mic. Yeah, I was just going to say, since we kind of dove into some of um, what Filmio is, um, maybe it would be appropriate to, you know, launch the soundbite, right, just to kind of put some context around this for those that don't really know holistically what it is, so... Filmio is a decentralized filmmaking ecosystem that helps creators build a community around their film or TV project 
and then with that help them gain access to funding and distribution. Um, so that's really, you know, the kind of cornerstone of what's happening here is this ecosystem is a holistic filmmaking ecosystem that covers really every aspect of the filmmaking process. And it's very, very community driven. And it was really created because the traditional Hollywood system um, has failed. It's failed creators, it's failed fans, it's even failed the other participants in it that we were talking about earlier from, you know, studios on down. And, you know, a lot of this stems from the lack of diversity, equality, inclusion, um, and the lack of, you know, sort of democracy uh, within the industry. And we all saw this and we all suffered um, from the studios through the creators and all of the industry participants down to the fans during the strikes. And all of that was stemmed from centralized power. Um, and, you know, really the, the genesis of this thing and, you know, really the, the, the need for the underpinnings of blockchain come from exactly that is how do you disrupt the undue control or unfair centralized power construct around anything, whether it's a government or it's an industry or it's a business. And so blockchain really gave us a way to build a framework that enables just that. So, Brian, I, I totally appreciate that. And I will add something. I think my belief, and maybe this is coming as a creator, though I'm a producer as well, is that Hollywood just lacks good stories, right? Like, it lacks the ability to make good stories. And this happens time and time again, by the way, right? So even in the 1940s, you know, you had the golden era of Hollywood, MGM. You had Irving Thalberg, the big producer there, who was running basically his version of writer's rooms. And they were make, they're churning out great stories, right? MGM was, you know, the, I mean, like Wizard of Oz, for example, right? Uh, but admit plenty of other ones. Um, and they, they were the kings until, you know, the U.S. sued them and had, you know, the, the Paramount Pictures, 19, I think it was 1947, 1948. But anyway, there was a thing that separated theater chains from the distribution from the studios. And that really yeah. was the beginning of the modern downfall. In the modern day, you have Pixar. I used to work at Pixar. Well, Disney, and after the golden era, the second golden era of animation, the 90s, you know, where they made like Aladdin, Lion King, and, you know, all the stuff we love, Aladdin. Uh, then st stopped having the ability to make good movies, so they had to acquire Pixar. Not not for the movies, uh, not for the compute, not not because of Render Man or things Pixar had, but because they wanted the creative brain trust to help them make movies again, right? Stories. So, and, and there's something about the way Hollywood functions that just ruins. After some wild successes, these companies just ruin the ability uh, to make good stories. Um, it, it's because and, the um, money aspect of it is first. <laughs> Creative is judged Agreed. by its ability to generate revenue, not by its ability to connect to the audience. And there's millions of great stories out there from people who aren't in the system, and the system exists to keep them out. And keeping the stories out because the world should actually choose what it wants, and then we should see whether it's financially viable or not, as opposed to money chooses what gets made. And, and that's what's wrong with yeah. the system today. Yeah, and, and often that money doesn't know what to create, right? It just follows and <laughs> follows what, what's there for. Uh, Emily and Pattern, I, I promised you guys the mic, so I want to get you guys in. So Emily, why don't you, why don't you uh, go for it? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that there's a really interesting historical evolution in regards to cinema that um, doesn't normally get addressed. And that's that cinema traditionally was the fastest way to get news out to the different, more isolated corners of, of America and of the world. You would kind of go to the cinema and you might watch the same thing that you've seen a um, hundred times, but it was pretty inexpensive. And they would run uh, clips of news and bits of government propaganda and um, before and after the little video that you were about to watch. And um, I, I think that that's a really interesting component of the evolution of, of how propaganda was really disseminated um, because it, it used to be a very easy channel to get political ideology and um, kind of cultural norms fed to the populace. Um, however, as it became easier to produce or more people started producing and it became more affordable 
um, we, we started getting more of these feature length films and um, other sources of information started being used and there was there was a break in there and I think that break um, kind of from it being a tool of the government to put ideas in our head be used um, to recruit people during wars or um, kind of uh, align ideology it became more of a, a cultural evolution and then once the internet really took over that social media side the government absolutely lost control entirely over the narrative and the last the last real ability that they have to control the narrative is through the federal reserve at this point and by financing things that they want to uh, persuade people to to stand behind and it creates a big political rift so it, it almost seems like film should have been the first thing to hop on to cryptocurrency but it seems like it's one of the last things to hop on just because of just because of the evolution around how it was used and its distribution mechanics were used historically and i i think that that creates a really interesting dynamic um that can be overcome through crypto so, uh, Emily, I think I appreciate the, the historical perspective there, but uh, wanted to kind of dive into some of the things you said. And so one of the things, well, if you think about what, how did film monetize, well, how did theaters monetize before? Theaters, sorry, I mean, 1850s theaters, right? Before film ever existed, you know, you had Wagner saying, you know, opera is the ultimate art form, right? It's got music, it's got sound, and, you know, they sold tickets. It's a premium model, right? You, you paid your ticket. Maybe you're an aristocrat and you had some kind of like season pass effectively and you went to the opera house and you saw your three hour opera and that was great. You saw your friends and maybe did some business. Then the film came around. It was disruptive innovation, right? Innovator's dilemma. And the way that they first monetized after these little, you know, film, black and white, soundless films of a train coming into station, yet, you know, you had the Nickelodeons. People literally put in like nickels or pennies and they, you know, put their head in a, you know, in what looks like a VR headset now, but in the 1800s, 1900s. And they would, you know, turn it real and they would see a quote film for like five seconds, right? Almost like a TikTok. And they would pay small amounts for that. You know, then we had films the way that we saw in the 90s with theaters, premium model. And then Netflix killed Netflix and YouTube just disrupted everything. And now TikTok, right? So I guess today, right? I mean, if you are, I think you're right. And you and Brian and others and Ian have talked about how the economic models breaking down have affected the way in which films have monetized. But in this day and age where it's cheaper than ever to make a high quality film production wise, right? So, so that the cost, I mean, even someone with an iPhone can now make a quote film, right? So the cost have come down, but the distribution is still being held onto by the, you know, the majors, right? Sort of the big studios, right? I'm talking about, you know, like the way film distribution is and part of it is marketing. So actually I, I'd, I'd say to you, part of what crypto has, I, I think that there's actually a lot of problems with film, quote films getting on crypto, like a ton of problems. I mean, some simple ones are just like video quality upload rates, 4K, you know, 24 FPS being great on YouTube, for example, but being terrible on even X, right, which is trying to optimize and build on video, right? Like when we upload our quote film pieces on, on X, uh, you can't upload 4K and the, the bit rate is terrible and the audio is terrible. So uh, just some examples, right? So and, and X is doing trying to do a great job and they got a lot of money, right? Let alone other platforms. So I guess Emily or others, I, I just go back to you and say, um, you know, given how cheap it is now to make stuff, isn't it more about, you know, fundamentally disrupting distribution, right? And what does it take to do that? Yeah, um, if, if I could just hop back in um, sure. and wrap up my thoughts on it. Um, I, I, I do think that it's got a lot more to do with the distribution yeah. side um, than it does to actually storing. Uh, Ian, do you mind muting? There's a weird reefer. Oh, Ian, you might have a hot mic. Uh, yeah, okay, here we go. We'll, we'll come back. To um, you. Yeah, I, I think it has a lot more to do with the supply chain, right? And what I think the power in crypto really does come from the ability to put the supply chain back in the hands of the populace and allow people to take part in roles that they were previously unable to take part in just because of the sheer volume of wealth it would have required. Whereas now it's a lot easier to make something like a trustless contract to allow people to participate um, in a size that they're able to participate in, right? Like you can you can basically crowdfund a film um, that is going to require you know some sort of funding or some sort of way for the people participating to make sure that they don't starve and end up homeless in the meantime, um, and they can partake in the the uh, actual income at the end of it, right? Like that that's a very simple model, but at the same time, someone may choose to participate 
in a distribution mechanic and they could say, oh, you know, if, if this studio has the ability to generate this many eyeballs, then I want to have a deal with the studio and I want to effectively create liquidity for the consumption of this content and they'll participate by, um, you know, backing that side of things and creating a better environment for people to come in and consume it. Like, I, I don't think the solution is really, you know, storing films on blockchain. I think it's more of the DeFi side of things where you're able to participate in, you know, the, the producer role or the distribution role or even the, um, e even like a, a reputation score um, that solves a lot of the, the social problems that exist in Hollywood right now and just making these things more accessible to people in general and giving, giving every artist a chance if they can get the exposure. Oh my God, it's like, it's almost like you uh, went through Filmio and sort of plucked out all of the features that we have in there. That's really spot on, Emily. That was amazing. Um, the, let me just tell you guys a, a little bit about this um, because I think this is really key and you touched on some amazing points. I 100% agree with the fact that it's not about leveraging Web3 for streaming. Um, one thing that Web3 is very clunky at is large file sizes <laughs> and that's not really a thing right now and it's probably not even important the, oh yeah we try to put a vr film we try to put a vr film on bitcoin ordinals with like 400 kilobyte file sizes you know instead of gigabytes <laughs> and we actually yeah. succeeded we created a small you know little artifact so we did how that do you last compress summer. it you know <laughs> well i mean we it was done through compression procedural, well I, i'll put this up in the nest it's the first vr bitcoin ordinal ever we did it with one, our, our tribeca film festival film alamet but it's literally this collections of 400 kilobytes and uh, you're right. It doesn't work with traditional film. It's like JavaScript procedural filmmaking, but that doesn't apply to like what most people have now. So yeah, I agree with you, Brian. Generally. Yeah. I mean, you but, have Filecoin, you yeah. know, but that can get expensive and it's also not great for, you know, Agreed. multi terabyte files, Agreed. but you know, I mean, so really like diving into the heart of, of, of this matter, um, community becomes so important, right. For the exact reason that Emily mentioned, which is, um, you know, when you're able to curate a community as a creator, you really take back all the power, right? When you're a creator and, you know, this actually is true for the fledgling filmmaker to, you know, the intermediate sort of director that, you know, wants to get behind a project to even the more seasoned sort of A-list uh, celebrity talent in Hollywood. Like everyone has seemingly this really difficult time navigating um, this, current filmmaking sort of Hollywood quote-unquote ecosystem. And that's actually true not just in the actual Hollywood, but all of the filmmaking ecosystems around the world have this problem. But when you're able to tap into community and you build a reasonable community behind your project, um, and you could say, you know, there are crowdfunding sites that actually do this. So if you want to launch a crowdfunding project for your film idea, you could do that on Indiegogo or Kickstarter. The problem is the friction is extremely high. Very few projects, when the first thing they ask the community to do is pay money, very few of those projects or creators succeed, right? And it's kind of rude, I think. Like, let's just go out and ask people for money. They don't even know us. How about build a relationship with them first? And that's what you can do inside of Filmio is you curate a community. The projects in Filmio where the creators have embraced the ecosystem to be able to share content about their journey, about their story, about the filmmaking process. Maybe they shared some props and a story behind how difficult it was to make them or the genesis of the story. They start to curate a community that care and that community starts to grow. And when you have a community that cares, that starts to gain scale and size, you can actually choose your path. You might still choose to go to Netflix. You might choose to um, you know, go straight to distribution of any form, or you might choose to go, you know, seek money from one of the film funds or a studio. But the thing is, it's up to you because you can push a single button. This is an upcoming release, by the way, the funding tools will be launched soon. Right now it's about community curation and growth, but we are launching soon the crowdfunding uh, functionality in, in two flavors. One, non-dilutive. If you want to launch an NFT campaign, give people some uh, digital assets from the film itself and let them participate in that way. Great. Every fan who stakes fan tokens, which is our governance token, to a project becomes 
um, actually gains access to the allow list. It, it, it records their place in line so that when that project with their now curated community, let's say it's 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 fans um, that have been following the project for a while, once they, the creator pushes the button and says, launch this NFT campaign or launch this you know, regulated crowdfunding campaign, let's say a Reg CF in the US allows $5 million, um, those people on the allow list in the community get an invite and they are able to participate. And they can do that with fiat, they can do that with other cryptocurrencies, they can also do that with the FGR that they earned from... Uh, the FGR is fan governance rewards, uh, which are governance rewards we pay out in our native token. So every community member has a chance to participate in that funding campaign. And, and this is really the heart of it, is that when they have the community, they have the power. And that's yeah. sort of the first invention here and something that's incredibly important to turning all of this around. Um, and it doesn't mean that the rest of the ecosystem is going away. But that community really is the key to unlocking um, all of your success going forward as a, as a creator. I have so many questions based on, on that, Brian. And I do want to go to the hand pattern as well uh, at some point and address some of the comments we're getting. We're getting quite a lot of comments. So congrats, uh, team, on getting some feedback uh, from, from the community, so to speak, on X. But, um, you know, Brian, I guess the question that I would ask then is like, you know, as a, fil like, as a filmmaker, totally get it. Like, makes sense. As, as an audience member, it's like, like, why would I care, right, as a consumer? Because, like, I got more things on YouTube than I could ever watch in my entire life. I got more things on TikTok I could ever watch in my entire life. I got Netflix. If I want long-form content that's curated, I got Netflix and HBO Max and, you know, Disney and blah, blah, you know, just keep going, right? And, and the thing is, what, what is it about the consumer that they would care about these things, right? Because to your point, that's been a big pain point. Like, getting... Like crypto doesn't like I don't think filmmakers want crypto, right? You know what I mean? Like they, they just want money, right? To to be frank, right? An independent filmmaker, what they need is money. And maybe crypto is a tool to help them get that. But community, to your point, is a much more sustainable way. Right. I mean, think about the community that was built around Star Wars, right, in the nineteen seventies, right? The the ad hoc communities. There's no crypto back then, but that was what made that so successful. So I, I guess, you know, crypto is a potential solution, but it doesn't seem to be the core of the heart of the problem, right? As a consumer where you know, images just can, can be just be ripped off or copied, you know, just recording on a screen on your phone. Um, and it's just so easy. This is why GameFi in some ways has more moats because the distribution is different, right? You have to distribute like executable files and applications, you know, to play your, you know, whatever it is, right? Like um, whatever Web3 game, like your Axie game or whatever, right? I mean, that's on a website, but still it's kind of like centralized in that way. Brian, I, I go back to you or others and just say, um, why as a consumer should I care, right? Okay, great. Indie person. Um, sure, there are indie projects that get, you know, hype on Kickstarter, but there's few and far between, and usually the big guys come in and acquire them for a lot of money, right? Look how Netflix is spending tons of money on making webtoons, right? Which is like a literally a, a comic on your phone that's spending tens of millions of dollars trying to make, adapt those to Netflix. Uh, this is out of Korea, by the way. But yeah, Brian or, or others. Yeah, you know, one, one of the things, so, so I have really two answers for that, right? One of them is, you know, getting back to sort of the financial motivation, which is, there are a lot of people that would love to be a co-producer in a movie, um, you know, as an investor, right? Like an executive producer, that's not something that's common. And again, when you go to Indiegogo and you look at the films there, you don't have any social proof that the film's going to be successful. So inside of Filmio, if you're a film buff and you've always kind of wanted to be in the industry and you don't have millions of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars, but you'd love to be part of a bunch of films that are sort of growing and the community is growing around them. So the social proof is also growing. And with our Go score, which is an algorithmic scoring system, um, we think it's a, you know, um, predictor of commercial viability. Um, and actually that was coined by um, a big studio exec who's actually working with us behind the scenes on Filmio um, from one of the major current film studios. Um, so, you know, if you're a film buff and you want to get involved in the industry, what better way to do it than to go in and be, you know, part of the team early and follow some great projects along the way and participate. And in a way, we've created kind of this gamified ecosystem. So it is, in a way, kind of a game. You know, there are lots of things you can do in there to participate. Um, and so the financial motivation is something that I think is real. And It's like treating um, the film as a real-world asset, right, and securitizing it. Yeah. Kind of like you would yeah. securitize a house. 
So how do you like legally then? Okay, so let's say, you know, I mean, you know, I was at Sundance. Sounds like you guys were as well. I saw your guys' video before this. Yeah. Was, uh, I wish I had uh, had my ears open a little more. Uh, I was doing an AI talk there, as I mentioned, um, but didn't do as much Web3. Uh, but great, great video and, and just great excitement. You know, I live in Park City as well, by the way. Lived here for a few years. Um, so uh, great to see some local, uh, some local uh, activities and stuff happening uh, uh, in the film and Web3 space. But I guess the, the question I'd ask is um, regarding that is, you know, it makes sense you would securitize it. Are there legal? So, okay, so I don't know. Sundance comes in, or, you know, people come in, uh, Amazon or Netflix or others, and they acquire films for sometimes 10 plus million dollars, $20 million. You know, Spotlight used to be a big player. So is there some legal way in which you're securitizing it? So like holders of, I don't know, like XYZ movie, you know, coin get paid, you know, like legally, they get the percentage of whatever it is that they put in. And do they get like, are those all clear? And is there legal stuff that's in place to make sure that if the thing does get acquired by Netflix before $20 million, that all the token holders get paid, for example, or what's the monetization? Right, right now, we're not really diving into that component of it, because like you said, it is a little complex, um, a little dicey. Um, there are securities law issues around those kinds of things and whatever. So really what we're doing is we're giving people a platform to effectively make a choice as to which way they want to go about raising capital. And they will rely on more traditional um, structures to do that. Like I mentioned earlier, like a Reg CF offering, a Reg A plus offering, which would open up to, I think, a $100 million raise, those kinds of things where we work like a through. Film doing, you mean a film doing a Reg A plus offering. Basically. Yeah, exactly. And we work through <laughs> broker dealers. You know, we don't get involved in that, sure. that regulated side of it. We're yep. really about, you know, bringing the options to the table, right? Like kind of making the introduction to that uh, piece of, of the equation, but bringing the big community to the table and really empowering the creator by giving them choice. Um, but I want to touch on um, the other aspect of this, the community aspect of, you know, the motivation for, you know, why anyone cares, like why do fans care or, you know, how do they care? So we're all familiar with IMDb, probably fandom.com, great sites like that. Fandom has, you know, apparently 300 million monthly active users who come in to do nothing more than consume and sometimes contribute, you know, content to wikis, right? Like information about Star Wars or whatever, you know, film uh, they are in love with or want to learn about. And uh, it kind of shows that fans will just be fans. You know, fans love film. They love stories. They love interacting. And actually what we've done is we've created kind of a three-dimensional version of these formerly you know, very, very active sites, you know, in a way that you can actually directly interact with the films and the filmmakers and the community. Um, so, you know, we see a lot of people migrating over here when they discover Filmio. Um, they appreciate the ability to get in and actually interact. And sometimes, you know, they comment on a film in the newsreel, which is um, kind of a page where creators can share content and fans can interact and when the creator responds it just sparks a conversation and i think that's incredibly rewarding for people to be there early to be able to interact to be involved and uh you know it gives them that similar sort of you know fulfillment and enrichment that you'd get from um you know participating early in anything and for film lovers, you know, it's the perfect environment, I think, for them to go in and do something more than just spectate. What's the, uh, you know, let's say, let's talk about two sides, because in a marketplace, you've got the creators, which are the filmmakers in this case, and then you've got the, you know, consumers, right? I guess the viewers or the backers or really the, you know, the, the producers, the potential producers, so to speak. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking at your site and, uh, you know, I was looking at this before, but, you know, you've got a bunch of projects on here, like Bitcoin Saves El Salvador. It looks like a documentary. Uh, as well as Ring Cave, which looks like it. I mean, so are you saying that this looks like it stars a Hollywood star, for example? Uh, looks like it, anyway, unless it's AI, uh, which is also possible. I guess <laughs> what's the sweet spot for your filmmakers, right? So that's number one. I'm going to go to the consumers, like the viewers, producers later. But let's say you're, you know, I don't know, a, a well regarded filmmaker. You're looking to do your next project on Filmio. Um, you know, what's the, like, because there's the whole like YouTube thing of people spitting out like two, three, four minute stuff. And I actually think there's a, there's a whole market there that's, you, you know, actually still growing, right? Like, I mean, the YouTube, you know, episodic series. Uh, and then there's here, right? So these look like bigger, like movies. They don't even look like TV series, right? So it looks a little different. So what's the sweet spot for you? What kind of budgets are we talking about? Are we talking about like a hundred million dollar budget? So these guys are looking to raise a hundred million bucks on Filmio, or are we talking like smaller check sizes, for example? 
would love to hear. I think Ian, uh, Ian can give you the best uh, answer since he's speaking to creators and filmmakers all day. I'm not sure if he's still a uh, speaker here. I mean, I will say that it does, um, you know, Looking it does have back. a wide range. You know, it's basically from, you know, the creator that just needs uh, a little boost, 30 grand, a million dollars. Um, this is why, you know, the community is so important because not only does the community provide the direct means for the funding, but if the film is actually a much larger budget and it would be unlikely to raise a hundred million dollars for a film, the one thing you can say for sure is that when you have, you know, a hundred thousand uh, loyal fans behind a project and you can see the metrics um, around this project and the engagement, when the creator goes to, you know, raise that money, any investor has um, a much stronger set of data to be able to make a decision and the creator has you know a tool they've never had before so we really see it going across the entire sort of gamut of budget ranges but yeah i mean i think ian does a lot of this uh direct interaction with creators all day long and uh, might want to chime in there i was just going to add that most of the decisions are data driven in acquisition and most of the most of the distribution solutions have really a uh, clear understanding of who their audiences are and what kind of content they need to connect to those audiences and one of the things that this platform is is a commercial viability prediction machine that uses data from both on the platform and off the platform to create a commercial viability prediction score that we call the ghost score. And the, the idea that people, the world, should be the people to determine what should get made. <laughs> the fact that the world's fans are an afterthought to the to 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 the Hollywood world is is just hilarious to me that that instead of them saying we want this they're fed what is most financially viable to the to to the you know studios and and don't get me wrong i love a great studio picture like i love everything else but i keep asking this question how many great independent films could you make for 200 million dollars and and wouldn't it be okay if maybe we had one less big studio film and 500 independent films? I'm just saying that that some of my favorite films that I've ever watched in my world in, in my life were small films that cost little to make and didn't make any studio any money, but they were still glorious adventures. You know, I want to see all of it not just the ones that are served up because they make the most sense financially. Uh, and, you know, power to, I, I feel the same way. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, that's the reason why as an independent filmmaker, it, it makes a lot of sense, I guess. You know, so if, if creators get on your platform of any funding type, like, is there, you know, I mean, I've seen the most staked plot projects across your platform. I mean, what kind of liquidity are, are people seeing as creators? Uh, and I guess, what do those creators have to give up, right? So if it's not economic rights, which to your point, you know, it suddenly looks like a security pass the Howie test, they get it, um, I guess is a way to do it in a, in a regulated way. Uh, for sure, there is a way to do it in a regulated way. But uh, yeah, what, uh, what kind of, check, what kind of um, you know, when you look at the fan token, for example, uh, which, you know, uh, we can talk a little bit about, but we do have to wrap up. I, I could talk about this forever, by the way, but we, I'm getting notes from the team that we have to wrap because we have enough space. But yeah, the... I guess, what kinds of um, liquidity are these teams receiving and what are they giving up, I guess, right? Or is it just, yeah, well, i just love to see what the so, equation so is. So far, it's been very organic. And really what we've done is brought a lot of exposure to films that are on the platform. And there are users in there um, that we've seen from various uh, financing sources and within the distribution world that have gone in and, you know, found projects that have created success stories for those creators um, the funding tools are actually getting ready to launch soon. Um, and we actually just, um, through a series of a bunch of different events, um, see that the fan token, the native, the native governance token for the platform, 
uh, was just listed on exchanges. So um, that's on Uniswap and uh, a centralized exchange called MEXC and probably soon to be others. And that starts to really unlock liquidity within the network for um, lots of other great things to happen. Maybe a topic for a follow-up, uh, you know, AMA, <laughs> not to take up too much time. Yeah, definitely. I think we're going to get to close, close to the ending, but I uh, want to go to each of you to, to just talk about. And by the way, just as a creator, I'm actually just truly curious. I mean, I've been thinking about this for a while, as you can probably tell. Uh, I've actually kind of generally ruled out. I've been a skeptic, to be frank with you. I've been more of a, uh, I've been more of a bull on, on GameFi, but as we have this discussion, I'm, I'm more and more interested. And I, I say this in a very uh, direct way. So who do I, as if I'm a creator, who do I follow up with here? Follow up with me. And here's the thing, Eugene. If you want to change the world, you got to get on board. It's as simple as that. You know, it, the, the, lots of people talk about how they would like things to be different. This platform is a real machine that can bring change, but it's only going to be successful if people get on board and they participate. I, I've talked to creators who have access to the Hollywood system, who have been a part of the Hollywood system, who have successfully distributed films, and they say that they want to play on this platform because they too, even though they have access, are don't like the way the current system works. And I always say, here's the thing, you can talk about change, changing the world or you can change the world and it's only going to change if we the people together don't get together and make this happen here's a real possible solution let's use this one it exists yeah and with that said we're open to creators reaching out you can contact ian um, you can of course submit a film um, to film.io um, you can do that. It will uh, go through a review process and eventually be published if it meets the, um, you know, sort of DAO driven, um, you know, criteria, which is just all about, you know, um, fairness, equality, inclusion and, you know, non-discrimination and things like that. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, further to that, we're open for partnerships. We think every participant, every industry player has a place inside of Filmio, right? Whether you're a studio, you're a production company, you're a film financier, you're a actor, producer, director, whatever, there's yeah. a place in here for you because what we've done is from the ground up, we have reinvented Hollywood. And that's really the idea here is that we've reinvented Hollywood and we've given it back to the people through a DAO. And this DAO is free to participate in. You can join you can receive fan tokens for free and you are a DAO member and there are different levels to the DAO but effectively you know come and join us we are um, embracing everybody as long as they and you know please go read the DAO constitution because it's all about goodness and that's what the spirit of this whole thing is it's a revolution awesome. for the film industry and yeah. you know we're, we're open for partnerships and everything else that uh, wants to come to the table. Amazing. Brian, Ian, and team, I, I wish I could. I wish I could yeah, give you guys okay. more, but we'll have to do another space. Drop me a DM and we'll uh, we'll do this further. But seriously, guys, great work, great progress, and we should do a follow-up space. I mean, there's clearly not enough time to cover the transformation of Hollywood in one. Thanks to the whole That's audience. True. This Thank was amazing. Thank you so much, guys. Thank yeah. you. Much love. Take care, everybody. Sure. See you in the next